Hola, welcome back to the wonderful world of mathematics for liberal arts, chapter one. Now, as I'm sure you guys will recall, this last couple of videos have been focused on the plurality method, the board account method. So this time around, we're going to introduce a brand new voting method, which is going to be called plurality with elimination. And for those of you paying attention, that is a hint that there's going to be some similarities between plurality with elimination or PWE as we typically call it, and the plurality method. It is going to have to be a more complicated technique because we've already seen plurality is just not sophisticated enough to handle all of the demands of an election. So we're going to add some sophistication to make PWE work. PWE happens in rounds. What's going to happen is in the very first round, we're going to tabulate the votes the first place votes only, and the candidate with the most first place votes is the winner of that round. However, once we figure out who has the most first place votes, then we ask, does that candidate hold majority? One of two things can happen. Either they hold majority, in which case we skip any other steps and go directly to the outcome, and then we're basically just using plurality method, or the round winner doesn't hold majority, and that's more interesting. In that case, what we have to do is find the candidate with the fewest first place votes, eliminate them, and then shift all of the columns up so that that way there are no gaps in the preference schedule. Their first place votes, that is the first place votes of the candidate who was elected, who was eliminated, they switch down to the next person in that column, and then we start a new round. In round two, we do exactly the same thing. We see who has the most first place votes. If they hold majority, we skip to the outcome. And if they do not hold majority, we eliminate the candidate with the fewest first place votes this time. We shift the columns up as necessary. And then we start round three. And we just keep cycling through over and over and over again. If we keep doing that, eventually we are going to reach a round where somebody has both the most first place votes and a majority. And when that happens, we can start talking about our outcome. Now, if we have a winner only election, then once we reach the last round, whoever is the round winner wins the election. If it is a full or partial ranking election, then what we need to do is we need to figure out who is the second place person because the first place person is whoever has the most first place votes and majority. If there are only two people left over, then that's easy. The second place person is actually going to be the person who is not the round winner. If there's more than two people left over in the last round, then we will conduct additional rounds until eventually there's only the round, the winner for the entire election, the first place candidate, and then one other candidate. That candidate is going to be second place candidate. The person who got eliminated in the previous round is going to be the third place candidate. The person who got eliminated two rounds prior is going to be the th uh, th fourth place candidate, and so on and so forth. And if that sounds a little complicated, here's the flow chart which describes it. The flow chart's really easy. You start out here in box one, you move down to box two, and you answer either yes or no. If you answer yes, you move to outcomes, like I described a second ago, and otherwise, you follow these boxes back up to box one. Then you go back down to box two and you answer yes or no. If it's no, you go back through the cycle again. And you just keep doing that over and over and over again until eventually you can get to box two and answer yes and produce the outcome. Let's go ahead and see it actually applied to an example. So we have the TSU Math Club election again. We're going to give a full ranking under PWE. So let's go ahead and start this out exactly like we would with plurality. But we're also going to really quickly figure out just how many voters there are, since we need to know something about majority. We add together all of the number of voters in this uh, top row right here to find the number of voters in the election. And then majority well, if you need a refresher, I suggest you go back to the section 1.1 video, but briefly, majority means that you hold more than half the votes. Half the votes in this particular case would be half of 37. 
or 18.5 for those of you with a calculator or quick mental math. We need to have more than that and we can only hold whole numbers of votes. So that means that it should be 19. Okay, so with all of that setup done, we see that A has 14 first place votes, B has four, C has 11, and D has eight. Now, nobody in this round holds a majority. A is the round winner, and A does not hold majority in particular. So we're going to eliminate somebody. And it looks like that somebody is going to have to be B. Sorry, B. So we're just going to cross B out of the table, so that way we remember who we've eliminated. And even though technically B's votes transfer down in every single column, the only columns we're interested in are the columns where B held first place, for now anyway. We see that B only held first place here in column four, and the person, the candidate, underneath B is D. So D is going to get all of B's first place votes, and we can go again. This is round two. Now in round two, A hasn't changed at all, and C has not changed at all. Only D changed by getting all of B's votes, which puts us at 12 votes for D. Now, once again, A is the round winner, but also once again, we see that there is nobody who holds a majority. So that means we eliminate C, the person now who has the fewest first place votes. Now, this is a slightly more interesting case. We notice that unlike B, C was first place in column two and in column five. So that means that potentially C's votes could go to two different people, somebody in this column and somebody in this column. So let's see who the votes go to. Okay, C was eliminated, it should go down to B, but B was eliminated, so that means it has to go down to the next person, which is D. Okay, so D is getting some of them. Um, oh, and look. C's votes go down to D in this column as well. Okay, so that means that only D is getting new votes. Okay. So A is going to remain the same as it has been since the beginning, but D is going to get an additional 11 votes, which puts us at 23. Up, oh, there we are. We have a round winner who has majority, so now we can begin ranking everybody. Now, since D is the first person to both be a round winner and hold majority, that means that D is first place. Uh, it looks like in the very last round we conducted, there were only two people, so the non-winner was A, and that makes A second place. The person who was eliminated in the round prior was C, so C is third place, and the person who was eliminated in the round prior to that was B, so that makes B fourth place, and we're done. Not too bad. It's a lot like plurality, like we said. It just has one or two small changes. Let's go ahead and do just another one, another example, so that way we get a better handle on things. Okay, so now we have this really uh, awesome example about aliens coming to take over the world, and one of them is going to end up becoming the overlord of Earth. So let's see who we have to bow to. Uh, we're going to have a, B, and C, so that's a little bit shorter than last time. And let's see, um, we need to go ahead and find out who holds majority and who doesn't. So let's see, uh, number of voters is 7 plus 8 plus 10 plus 2 is 27. And the majority... Well, half of 27 would be 13.5, so that means majority has to be 14. Okay, so let's count up. A has nine first place votes, B has eight first place votes, C has 10 first place votes, and that is the end of it. So let's see, um, it appears that nobody holds majority, and it also appears that B is the person with the fewest first place votes, so we eliminate them. 
Uh, B was in the first place row only in column two, so all of B's votes go down to C, okay? So now we have A and we have C. A still has nine first place votes, but now C has 18. Aha, uh -huh. so they hold majority and they are the round winner, so we're gonna stop at this point. Now let's see, are we doing a full ranking? Oh, no, it says right here, give a winner only result. So that means that C wins. And there you go. This all seems pretty good. Nothing here is too complicated. Nothing here is uh, too weird looking. It seems like maybe this is a great method. And it definitely has its strengths. So the first one is that PWE is pretty quick to implement in every single round. And since the rounds really are just plurality, which is quick, followed by checking the round winner's first place votes against the majority, it's pretty easy to cycle from one round to another to another to another. It's very quick. So that part is really good. That makes it fairly expedient and potentially quite cheap to use. PWE is not influenced as strongly by insincere voting, which is also great. We really, really, really don't want insincere voters to ruin everything, both for themselves and for everyone else. So that makes PWE go up a notch in our esteem. Uh, PWE method eliminates the need for what are called runoff elections, which means you run an election, it turns out there's a tie, and so then you have to do another election to figure out who breaks the tie. PWE doesn't need that because we just conduct another round. PWE method also is better about taking voter preferences into account, much better than plurality method. Even though each round behaves like plurality, once we go from one round to another, we transfer votes. So that means we have to know something about voter preferences and we have to respect them. All of those are really great things. So with all of these strengths, is it correct to say that PWE is the answer to all of our prayers? Well, the answer is no. Let's backtrack for a second. Looking at this election, let's suppose for a moment that we ran the same election again with only one change. The aliens over here in the very last column decide that rather than ranking A highest and C second highest, they want C to be highest and A to be second highest. Okay, well what is that going to do? Well, one thing it's going to do is it's going to make the second to last column, column three, and the last column, column four, identical, so we'll have to combine them. But more importantly, what does that do to the outcomes of the election? Well, let me go ahead and do some setup here while I talk. You would think, since all that's happening is we're relisting C a little bit higher in one column, C should ideally continue to win the election. I mean, after all, we didn't really change too much else. C just now is preferred by more people than before. If anything, that should improve C's chances of winning. So that should make everything hunky-dory. But is that actually what happens? I assume that all of you can tell by the fact that I'm A doing an example and B voicing some skepticism, it's probably not what's gonna happen, but let's find out for real. Okay, so as before, we're gonna start tallying up votes. This time, A only gets seven first place votes since it no longer is the first place in the fourth column and the fourth column was absorbed by the third. Uh, B is still going to have eight first place votes. C is going to have 12. Now, just like last time, we don't have a round winner with a majority. But unlike last time, instead of eliminating B, who was the first person we eliminated last time, we eliminate A. Okay, that's a little different. But so what? Well, let's see. If I cross B... Uh, a out of this column, and out of this column, and out of this column. It looks like all of A's votes are going to transfer down to B. Okay, so let's just put that little plus mark next to B to tell us who's getting the extra votes. A had seven first place votes, so B has eight plus seven, fifteen. C's votes don't change, so C has twelve. 
Hmm. Now B is the round winner with majority. Hmm. That's not what we expected. Maybe PWE isn't quite as nice as we thought. Well, actually, let me go ahead and just disabuse some notions here. It's definitely not exactly what we want. It has a bunch of weaknesses. And this time when I say a bunch, I mean more than two. <laughs> uh, so the very first weakness is a weakness that it shares with board account method. If I have an election going, and for some reason I have to remove a candidate who wasn't winning anyway, and I give all of their uh, votes to the person beneath them, it's totally possible that I could change the entire election, including who wins. We don't have an example of that yet. We'll see an example of that in 1.6. But that's kind of not ideal, and it's a weakness that it shares with the board account method. Also, if a Condorcet candidate exists, sometimes that Condorcet candidate can still lose the election under PWE. That's also not ideal. And a third thing which is not ideal is the thing which we just investigated. Even though we may have a, a person winning the election already, it's not guaranteed that if I ran the same election with the same method and just ranked the candidate higher in one column or another, that candidate is still going to be the winner of the election. That's also not ideal. Once again, we have non-perfect voting methods. And if you weren't doubting that we were going to be able to find a perfect method before, maybe you ought to start doubting now. Now, one other thing I want to talk about really briefly is what's called instant runoff voting. Now, instant runoff voting looks almost identical to a, P a PWE method. There's really only one change. The difference is that in PWE method, we're going to be using... Uh, preference ballots, meaning we are going to have a full uh, a full list of candidates for the election and we're ranking all of them. In instant runoff voting, we're only using truncated preference ballots. And the result of that is sometimes when we're going from one round to another, we should be transferring first place votes down from one candidate to another in the same column, except there are no people left because we've eliminated all of them. When that happens, the vote is said to be exhausted. It stops being part of the election, and we actually retally the number of votes that are in the election. Now, for the exam, we're not going to be super interested in instant runoff voting. However, I want to cover it just in case A, you have questions, and B, there are some homework questions that deal with it. So let's do one right now. This table right here is based off of the Kingsburg mayoral election that's actually in your textbook. I don't have a number for you, but if you go to section 1.4 in your textbook, I'm sure you will find it. What we're going to do is use instant runoff voting with this truncated preference ballot. Now, it may not be obvious at first glance that this is truncated, but if you look at some of these columns, you'll see that I have entries like A and B over here, but then B and D over here. D doesn't appear in column 1. Actually, D doesn't appear in column 3 either. The moment that you see something like that happening, it's a pretty good bet that there's actually a much more extensive list of preferences somewhere, and this is just a cutoff version of those preferences. In other words, we're talking about truncated preference ballots. All right, well, let's go ahead and list things out. It looks like we're going to have A, B, C. I, I see C over here in column 3. D... And I also see an E over here in column 4. That's a little bit bigger than we usually deal with, but no big deal. Ah, and we might as well go ahead and start figuring out how many people there are in this election. So let's see, we have 93 plus 44 plus 10 plus 30 plus 42 plus 81. As good as I am, I'm still going to use a calculator for this because I don't want to get the numbers wrong. 30 plus 42 plus 81. Looks like there are 300 voters in this election. And that would make the majority... 
Well, half of 300 is 150, so that means the majority has to be 151. Okay, swell. That seems pretty good. Let's start tallying. Uh, A appears in the first place row only once for 93 votes. B appears only once with 44. C appears for 10. Oh, C appears twice, my bad. C appears twice, once for 10 and once for 30. So that actually means that C gets 40. Uh, D appears for 42. And E gets 81. All right, so it appears that nobody has majority, and it appears that C has the fewest. So we're just going to eliminate C from the election. So there you go, C is gone. Okay. Now C had first place votes both in column three and in column four. So that means that some of its votes are going to go to A, and some of them are going to go to E. A, B, D, E. Uh, let's see. A had 93, and it gets an additional 10, so that's 103. B stays at 44. D stays at 42. E goes up to, let's see, 30 plus 81 is 111. Okay, we're getting closer to a majority, but nobody holds it yet. It looks to me like we're going to be eliminating D. Okay, so we eliminate D here, we eliminate D here, and we eliminate D here. All right, so we have A in the election, B is in the election, and E is in the election. Okay, who gets D's votes? Oh, well look over here. D only appeared in the first place column one time in column one, two, three, four, five, in column five, and both D and C, the only people in that column, they've been eliminated. So that means that these votes, these 42 votes here have been exhausted. They're no longer representative of what's going on. So we need to cross out what we had for the number of voters and for the majority, and we need to recalculate. So we had 300 before, but we just lost 42 votes that were due to D. So we get 300 minus 42 is 258. And a new majority is going to be 130 votes. So the first person to have 130 votes is going to be our winner. All right, uh, so let's keep going. A has 103 because nobody gave new votes to A. Actually, nobody gave new votes to anybody because of what happened in column five. So we just duplicate everything. Looks like we're going to be eliminating B and we're going to distribute B's votes. So let's see, um, B is eliminated here, here, and uh, that's that. Okay, once again, everybody in the column where B was first place has been eliminated. So that means that 44 votes are crossed off the roster for us. So now we're gonna have to recount. So let's see, we had 258 voters before, but now that their votes no longer matter, they've been, well, no longer matter is the wrong term. They've been exhausted. That means that we have 214 voters left whose votes have not been exhausted. And now when we calculate majority, it should be more than half of 214. Half of 214 is 107, so that makes this 108. So we have A, and we have E. Nobody has gained new votes. Ah, but now look. In this around right here, even though we haven't gained any new votes, because the majority number has changed to 108, now all of a sudden E holds majority. 
Awesome, so that means that now we know who wins. E is going to be the first place candidate. Now, hopefully you guys are going to forgive me really quick. I've run out of room. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to erase all of this information here about majority, since we now know who wins. Ah, and just to make sure we don't forget, I'm gonna underline E like I've done in the past couple of things. Let's just eliminate all of this stuff since we no longer need it. Every once in a while when I'm erasing with this pen, I wonder if there's a faster way to do things. So let's see. First, second, third, fourth. Actually, we're only interested in the first and the second place candidate, so we don't really need any of the rest of them. We only need first and second. So first place is obviously going to be E, and second place is going to have to go to A. That's it. All right, that's all for now. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.